Hey, welcome to Whatcha Doin' with Brandon Horwin and Sophie Williams. And today's special guest is... Hi, everybody. I am Sydney Beers. Um, I graduated from Catholic U, um, probably before you were all born. No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, in 92, um, I currently work at Roundabout Theater Company uh, in New York City. And I'm the executive producer there. And I reside in New York City um, with my husband and my son. Excellent. Well, we are thrilled to have you on. Welcome to What You Doing. And thank you for joining us today. It's really a thrill to have you. Well, thanks um, for having me. So I just want to start out by asking you a little bit about your journey, uh, you know, with theater. Um, and if you could kind of um, give us an account of, you know, how it all started and where it led you to today. Okay. Um, well, theater for me started at a very, very young age. Um, I would say second grade. Um, I decided that I was going to be very famous, <laughs> a very famous actress. And that is, as you can see, taken flight. Um, and that uh, I can remember in second grade, I told my mom that it, I was going to produce a show. And she was like, a what? So I literally walked into the principal's office um, and said, could we gather the student body for me to put on a show? Um, and I, I, to this day, I remember that like it was yesterday. And I don't know, I, I come from um, a very, on my father's side, a very large Italian family. Nobody knew what theater was or anything with the entertainment industry. But I have always had a passion for the arts. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I dabbled a little bit in my high school in it, but I also was kind of more into sports because um, that seemed like the cool thing to do, I think, back then. Um, but uh, I also did a couple of musicals here or there. Um, and then I found this great thing called Catholic U and they had this amazing theater department and I did not enter right into theater. Um, I, you know, th that's the beauty of Catholic U, like, and college, like I was liberal arts and I took chemistry courses. I took um, political science, history, and I worked on the Hill. I thought, oh, I'm not going to do this. And then I stumbled on the drama department very early in my uh, career at Catholic. And I just, I felt like I, I fit in and that's where I wanted to be. So my journey, I guess, started with picking Catholic. I think that was one of the best decisions I ever made. Um, and from there, I found that Catholic sat in a haven of an incredible, incredible theater community. And I kind of embraced that. Um, and my junior year, um, I actually finished Catholic in three years. Um, I, I was always supposed to graduate in 92, but I finished my coursework. Um, I think I had one credit to take that first semester of my senior year, but I stayed involved in Catholic and I walked with my class and all that, but I got it. I worked at the Shakespeare theater and I can't stress enough. If you are a theater major at Catholic right now, I know right now it's crazy and we can't even, you know, there's. But at the time of pre-COVID, um, I walked into the Shakespeare Theater and I said, I want to do an internship. And I was lucky enough um, to be a part of, of the Shakespeare Theater. And then from there, I, I was in a couple shows at the Shakespeare Theater as an understudy. Um, and opening night, and I swear I was nowhere to be found, the girl, one of the girls I was under studying fell down the steps. It is not funny. She's fine. She's, but they called me without rehearsal to go on. And I'll never forget. It was Kelly McGillis and measure for measure. And I thought, what the, and on I went, um, and they threw costumes on me. Um, and that was, that was my seat. Not, that was my senior year at Catholic. And so that was it that I was, I was hooked. Um, 
And so that, that was just the start of my career. And if I wasn't on stage, um, somebody told me, um, I, I don't know if it was Gail, um, I don't, Gail Beach, but like always keep your hands in theater, like always make sure, like if your passion is on stage, do it like, but keep your hand in theater. So I, anybody who would hire me to do anything. So then I went to the Walnut and literally answered. I worked in the subscription office and I worked in the subscription office also at the Shakespeare theater when I wasn't on stage. And I just, so I figured out if I learned all the ticketing systems of all these theaters, you would have to hire me at some point. I worked in mail rooms and things, things to, to help me know more about the theater and the structure of it. Um, and then I got accepted to this program at Oxford while I was at the, at the Walnut Street. And my family was not crazy about me doing theater. And they pretty much said, well, you're going to have to pay for it. And I was like, you pay for it? So, <laughs> and I, I had five jobs. I waitressed at a place in Wilmington, Delaware, where I was from at the time. I worked at the Shakespeare, or I worked at the Walnut Street Theater. I house managed at American Theater Festival, I think it's called, it's not there anymore. And I also telemarketed for, I did all these different things and saved up enough money to go. And, um, and then kind of at the roundabout, when I got in at the roundabout, I just sort of, I started out director of sales while I was in some stuff off, off, off Broadway in New York. Um, and then I realized, I don't know, I got a hold of an Aaron Sorkin piece. This is, you know, um, ignorance is sort of bliss in that um, I found this Aaron Sorkin piece that nobody had produced that he wrote when he was at Syracuse. And I called him at home. <laughs> and I said, hello, um, can I produce this? And he's like, who is this? And I'm <laughs> I'm a very famous producer. You may not know this yet. <laughs> and he's like, sure, you can do it. And so it was hidden in this picture, it was called. And I produced this thing. I had raised like 15000 because you can only spend $15,000 on a showcase in New York. And all this is why I'm working at the Roundabout. And in their audience theater, now audience services, back then it was their I was director of sales. And so I decided that the people, you know, this is all before social media and everything, but the ticket buyers were my mom's age and all of those people were into um, soap operas, which really don't exist anymore, right? You know, it was now, what is it like general hospital? Um, <laughs> but so I called this guy. I got the number of this guy's dressing room. Um, his name is John Laprino. He was in um, gosh, One Life to Live. He was so cool. And I called him in his dressing room and he answered the phone. And I was like, listen, I have this piece that you have to do. And he did it. And so that I, it was an all guy, it was all guys. And I thought there wasn't a part for me in it. Um, and I thought, this is what I want to do. I want to produce. And that was sort of it. And that was the end of my long, lustrous acting career that ended. Um, and I, I, that's, that was it. I decided that I just wanted to produce and be in charge of putting it all together, soup to nuts. And it, I just had this, I have this tremendous love for it and passion for it. That's kept me in the arts, but so that was my long answer. Was that too long? So no, that was great. Okay, good. <laughs> you actually uh, just touched on this and I want to piggyback off of it, but you mentioned that you've held multiple positions at Roundabout. So was it a goal of yours to move up in the company or did it just happen organically? And for our audience, and for our audience, sorry, what skills are required in order for you to kind of be flexible between these positions? Um, my goal has always been to be involved in running something 
and and moving up and that was always my goal from I think if you have that drive you knew that from a very young age and I knew that um for me um when I worked at the Walnut Street Theater um Bernard Havard said that you have to try every course at a restaurant to really give a restaurant a good review um I don't think those were his exact words but <laughs> kind of mine in a sense like I don't think until you try everything that the chef is cooking, you know what it is. And I feel like to eventually, you know, Todd is the CEO of the roundabout, but if that's something in the next years that I do somewhere, um, I feel like if you don't test every avenue and don't know how to book the seats and house manage and who your audience is, and know who you're telephone raising to and know how to raise money and know how to market and who you're marketing to. Take the time to know who you're in the seats. If you don't try every different department in something, you, you, you just, you, I, I don't, you know, if you're working at, you know, at the stationary factory and you don't write a letter on the stationary, how do you know? Yeah. And so I feel like, that for me um, was sort of strategic. Um, I don't know how I strategically knew that at my age, but I did. And um, I, I also, when I deal with actors now, what little time that I did have on stage, I totally know what that's like. And that it, you need a village to get yourself on the stage. I mean, between nerves, between the thousand people you're playing to it's it's not tv is take a take in 20 and film 82 takes what we feel that day when we wake up and who we are at eight o'clock is what everybody's gonna see and so there it takes a village to support that kind of art and to to make sure like if somebody's sick and what that means and how like to really have a human nature about it and care about people so that's great so um your current position and title is executive director of roundabout theater company producer. in new york city producer, producer. i'm sorry producer okay. um, we, have, we have an executive director so gotcha <laughs> um so can you take us through the duties and responsibilities of that role um and sort of you know, coupled with that, you know, what appealed, like, so what appealed to you to the business side of arts administration and theater? And are you fulfilling those dreams and goals now in that role? Um, okay. So there's a, a pre post COVID, right? I guess. Yeah. So, I mean, to talk about what I did pre COVID, um, was I so the roundabout produces about eight shows a year and so I oversee all the producing aspects of of roundabout so um the soup to nuts of it and there's a financial component to that in terms of budgeting our productions and making all of those work and um basically a pot of money that I have um so so all the intricacies of getting stuff from ages to the stage was sort of what I was in charge of. Um, so how do you parlay that into an industry that shut down? Um, and it's the same kind of thing that you guys are doing like so like smartly is, you know, what can we do to continue to engage people? And so now my role is, is virtual. Um, our offices are closed, our spaces are closed. We're doing a lot of renovations on our spaces. Um, we are, you know, still have some people on payroll um, on the administrative offices, which is great um, that we're healthy enough as an organization to be able to do that. Um, and there's basically four of us that run the company and we're still continuing to run the company and still keeping it, trying to keep us in the forefront. 
Um, but yet knowing that virtual theater is not the answer. Um, and we've sort of made a conscious decision to make our type of theater only available to our stakeholders. So we haven't exactly um, advertised it, so to speak, because, you know, it, it, we're just trying to keep our stakeholders, subscribers, donors engaged as opposed to the rest of the world. Because that's not what we do. Film isn't what we do. Um, although we have, you know, I have been involved in recording some stuff for Broadway HD in the past. Um, and we're doing some archival streams within the organization of, of stuff that we've already done. But, um, you know, keeping, so that's sort of my post-COVID life is figuring out, you know, right now I'm in the throes of, uh, we usually have a 700 person gala that we fundraise for, which I produce that aspect of it, of, of the gala. Are we going to be able to do that? You know, that's usually March 1st. Um, so we're probably, we've already shifted it to June and we're looking at an outdoor venue, but even then, are we all going to be able, are 700 people going to be able to gather together? So am I producing a virtual gala? Oh my God. <laughs> you know, this has been a really hard time. Yeah. And the thing is, is it's it's not just on one person that it's a hard time. It's on the world, you know. Um. So, and the other thing is, I I sit on a couple of different committees about the reopening of theater as an industry, and how what does that mean, you know. A lot of people, I think, are criticizing us that we haven't opened yet. Like, why aren't we socially distancing the seats? Why aren't 200 people allowed in? And you're figuring out how to do that. And, you know, there's 52 Broadway theaters. Um, 42 were active. You know, we were active. I think 42 of us were active with shows. There's just no way. The model does not allow for it to happen, even if we ask people to take ma massive pay cuts. It costs so much money to run a show. And part of the experience is that you're sitting next to somebody enjoying a live performance and you don't know who they are, you know, and where they're from and, 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 you know, that whole magic of the people on stage versus who you're, who out, what other thousand people you're enjoying the live performance with. So yeah, I think it's really important. Like, we're so grateful to have you on for this is really a special episode because it is so important for folks to hear what is going on behind the scenes, you know, um, and to understand the conversations that are happening at the moment and how much of a, of a shift it really is for folks like yourself that are that you know normally had a, a a job of making it happen on stage and you knew darn well how to do that day in and day out but at this point it really is um still a a, a big challenge to adapt and and look forward it's like I'm, I'm glad you brought to our attention something like a gala that's like imperative to fundraising for a company yeah. like roundabout and the fact that it, you know, that, like, how do you shift that to um, a new norm per se for the moment? So we do, you know, we've done some cre some out of the box thinking, you know, which takes a village again. Um, but we, we reached out to a bunch of people who have worked at the roundabout before. And in this, uh, in the fall, we auctioned off private Zooms with like Liam Neeson and, you know, people, um, Vanessa Williams, people who are part of the roundabout family, so to speak. Um, a couple weeks ago, Jane Krakowski and I did um, a trivia night for our donors. Um, and it was like this whole theater trivia thing. Um, so it's all, it's this constant reinvention. Like we revisited Violet, um, the musical um, with Sutton Foster and Josh Henry and just did snippets of B-roll from it and um, had Janine Tesori there and our director at the uh, who did the piece, Lee Silverman. So, I mean, like, it's these 
it's these crazy one-offs that you never, it's this total reinvention um, that you kind of have to, to think about doing. Um, and then you also have to think about, you know, the roundabout employs so many people and we had to lay so many people off. It was, it was heartbreaking um, of the people who, you know, all our stagehands from our stagehands to our front of house, theater staff, ushers, box office, um, company managers, state, you know, all those people are out of work. And I don't, I don't think, I don't think the world gets what New York was and what Broadway theater was. And we were, we were like a huge part of the industry or the, the revenue of New York city um, with restaurants too. I mean, it, it's sad, you know, I, uh, I can't wait for us to reopen to get everybody back to work, you know? Um, yeah. While we're on that same note, and, and I had this farther down, but I think it really is good to sort of put it on a positive note now, based on what, you know, the committees that you stated that you're sitting on and, you know, conversations amongst the company uh, and the industry at large, where do you predict that it goes from here? Do you have a time frame that you think, you know, it may be, um, you know, now, you know, with vaccines rolling out and, you know, that kind of schedule being in place and, and things like that? I mean, so the, the last thing, I think we have excellent leadership um, in Governor Cuomo, and that has really helped us. So the last conversation with him, uh, you know, with the Broadway leg, which I wasn't, um, is, it, is, is tickets, you can get a refund for tickets through May 30th, basically. So the hope is June 1st. As an institution, because we have subscribers, we got to the point because we're just not dependent on single ticket sales. We're dependent on donors and all different things to run an actual company, we made the decision to move everything to the fall, which we've already done. So this way we don't hear. So basically right now I would be producing something to start in June. Like I would be actively building things and sets and costumes. So we felt safer to hear and have to convey yet again that we're not, this isn't happening. To actually say, you know what, we're gonna wait till the fall. So, you know, if you look at this rollout and what does this rollout mean? There's a couple things that haven't been answered yet. How long does this vaccine last? Do we know that? Um, is it a mandatory vaccine? Is it not a mandatory vaccine? Can we legally say to our audience members, you can't come to our theater without one? Um, you know, is that gonna happen in Catholic University? You can't come back to school unless you have a vaccine. Um, so, you know, 18 or over, is the vaccine safe for anybody 18 or over yet? Like, are, you know, so there's so many unknown factors that we've decided to plan out to what we think is the farthest out factor. Do I think there's going to be theater in New York? I think there is this summer, hopefully, knock on wood. Um, I think that it might be your hit shows, you know, your Hamiltons. Um, but so then you break it down and your Hamiltons are you know, catering to um, an international audience at this point, right? And, or way out of town, not a New York based audience. So how do you know if the person that you're sitting next to from France, I'm making this up, <laughs> is vaccinated or not? And what is, what is air travel then? And, you know, there's so many factors. I mean, you know, we are working facility-wise with air filtration systems and what kind of, you know, two of our buildings were putting in new air condition systems. I mean, so 
you know, that stuff's across. The other thing nobody's really been able to figure out yet is intermission. So what do you do when a thousand people stand up and can't socially distance and need to stand in a bathroom line and have 15 minutes to go to the bathroom? And, you know, we've all been I, to a Broadway theater or a concert venue or anything where the bathrooms are the bane of anyone's existence. <laughs> where you literally, that person sings the last note, you know intermission's coming and you're knocking down your row to be the person <laughs> in the bathroom line. Well, now what does that mean? You know what I mean? What, what, so I true, I believe personally, this is not an industry statement. This is a Sydney statement that until there's a vaccine and our country and world is vaccinated against this plague, this pandemic, I don't know how we congregate in a thousand seat closed in space with no windows. There are no windows. We cannot open the window, <laughs> you know? So I'm very confident in our next administration. Um, and I think that they, I think Joe Biden is the key to this too. And, and how safe our country is gonna be. Yeah. So changing the subject just a little bit, uh, you have produced multiple shows at Roundabout that have been nominated uh, and also have won Tony's as well as many other award shows. So speaking from uh, the production point of view, how important are awards and nominations to producers? Well, as my friend Maura says in Schitt's Creek, <laughs> award season is the favorite season. Now, my, <laughs> have you ever, she says that one episode, it, it's my favorite line. Um, how important is it? To the roundabout, um, it depends. You know, if we're doing a long running show, it's so important. It's so important. Uh, Hades Town, you know, winning what they won the last best musical yeah <laughs> how long has that been now five years now um <laughs> it provides a tour it provides you with having a tour it provides x amount of sales um the tony awards is our biggest marketing night um but for an institution oftentimes we're winning a tony where the show is closed mm. um you know so the ones that were announced for this 2020 season, you know, whenever they may be, um, those will go to a lot of the plays will have closed, um, mm -hmm. nominated for um, Soldier's Play. You know, if that wins, that'll be closed. So that's more of an amazing thing to have and a great thing to reflect your accomplishments. But a Tony, in the commercial world on a running show is a blessing. Mm -hmm. um, it really, you know, unless it's very obscure, you know, um, Wicked was thought to win the Tony. I was in the audience that night, um, Avenue Q won. And I was in the audience that night and they already had Wicked up as winning. Don't, don't maybe we shouldn't record that. <laughs> but, um, and it didn't. And Wicked is so iconic that it doesn't need that Tony. Yeah. Okay. It's based on an iconic, you know, The Wizard of Oz. Okay. Everybody in there, even, you know, the husband or spouse that you have to drag to theater knew what The Wizard of Oz was. Avenue Q needed that Tony. Avenue Q, it provided it to go on tour. It provided it. It was, I think it was going to stop in Vegas and didn't sit in Vegas for a while. Shows need that Tony to keep running um, on a new musical. And revivals, it's proven, don't really have a life, you know. Um, they're not shows that are really long running. Uh, Chicago has obviously <laughs> taken that theory because yeah. <laughs> they're like a genius at, at casting that. And yeah some amazing people but it's an iconic title yeah um so so i guess the answer is it sure does feel good when you know you work 100 hours a week which is what we normally do i mean that's the silver lining for me in covid i i mean i'm 
I, I'm home virtually with my family, um, you know, with my husband, with my son. Uh, I'm back in high school. <laughs> high school is down that hall. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's been a, you know, so to, but the Tony is very important to yeah. do a commercial show. Yeah. So what's your favorite show that you've produced at Roundabout? Can you pick one? <laughs> you know, it's hard. It's like, who's your favorite child? Who's your favorite? <laughs> like, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm blessed with only one, so that's pretty easy for me. <laughs> um, there, I have seriously loved every single show I've worked on. Mm -hmm. There's some special, special parts, you know. I, I mean, Cabaret is, is probably a really huge, huge, special place in my heart. Mm -hmm. um, I think that what Sam... Um, did when he directed it, he changed theater. And I sit and watch um, so many shows now where um, actors are the musicians and I think, oh, we did that. Um, well, he's yeah. uh, <laughs> smart enough to say, do it here. Um, and I think I kind of really got my chops set on that one and mm -hmm. learned so much. I mean, I was the general manager of Cabaret. I was 26 years old the first time. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't know what I was doing, um, but I figured it out. Um, and I, I really, um, I, I don't know. I guess there's, so there's definitely, and we had a lot of things happen. I don't even, I, I don't know if you want to hear this anecdote, but in 1998, July of 98, a crane fell on the Condé Nast building. I don't know if you guys have ever heard this story. Have you ever heard this? I don't think so, no. 8.30 in the morning and they were building the Condé Nast and we were doing cabaret at this 500 seat theater, 501 seats. It was at the Henry Miller, which we now, we now have the old Henry Miller, which is the Stephen Sondheim theater. It was rebuilt, but it was, ex um, but at the time it wasn't ours, we were renting it and a crane fell and it shut down all of uh, 43rd street for eight weeks. So Natasha Richardson never had her final performance. Mm -hmm. We went out scouting for a spot to put cabaret in and that's how Studio 54 came about. And we literally rebuilt the whole Kit Kat Club into Studio 54 in six weeks and then moved the show over to there because we knew viably we couldn't keep it going because it was only a 500 seat theater. And that, I mean, and we needed these thousand seats that we gained, well, 928 that we gained because it was table seating at 54 um, that we needed to make the move. And that's what we did. Um, so, that was a huge, you know, I renovated that whole space in six weeks. Mm -hmm. That was a big, big thing to be a part of. It was awesome. Yeah. So. That's great. That, I mean, not a great event, but you did find a very a great- Iconic event. building. Yes. Yeah. I mean, who knew? I didn't know what Studio <laughs> 54 was. I was like, oh, really? They did that in there. <laughs> <laughs> I know it because my dad went there. Oh my God. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you've shared with us like stories from your amazing career. Uh, what advice can you give to young artists and fellow CUA students or just uh, art students in general trying to make it in the business nowadays? Um, I think my biggest point of advice is art is a passion. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not a career. It's, it's, well, it, it, can, it is a career, but it's a passion. And if you don't have a complete passion to do this, you won't be able to put up with all the, the curve balls that come your way. You have to absolutely love, 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 and you need it in your veins. You, you need art in your veins to exist. And that's sort of how I feel. And as soon as you don't feel that, go. It's not the place for you because 
theater, entertainment industry, the hours that you work are, you would think that you were a brain surgeon. I mean, it's insane. Um, when we're mounting a show, we're up at, you know, the crack of dawn and we go home at the crack of dawn. So our theater family, we see sometimes more than our own family. Um, like there are times that I'm at the theater at eight in the morning and I leave at one at night when I'm putting up a huge musical. Um, I've missed a lot of weddings, funerals, family events um, that, you know, not my immediate family, um, but, you know, my extended family of, you know, I just, and vacations and things like that. You know, it's so funny. We find my husband works in the industry too, um, in the inter entertainment industry, and we finally have gotten a break, but we can't go anywhere. <laughs> you know, we can't enjoy that two week turn your phone off vacation that we've been longing to have. There's nowhere to go. So um, that's been, that's been tough but I mean I think I guess that's my advice and hard work you know there I don't know really have to work hard in this industry I think any industry to to succeed yeah um, but I think in an industry where you are told to give your body to it in a sense which you are you know it's not just your mind in theater it's it's you know if you want to be a performer and or a, any type of performer in the theater, you are dedicating your whole body as your instrument. So. Absolutely. Question. Thank, you. Thank you for that, <laughs> that advice. Um, so we've asked you about your favorite show, but just before we wrap up, I'd like, love to know if there is one particular person, um, star or person that you've worked with that you had just loved working with for whatever reason that you would like to share. Oh my God, there's so many. I mean, of course, my first husband, Antonio Banderas. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I'm blessed to like work with everybody. Like I have the best, you know, the head of the roundabout, Todd Haynes. He's the, the best of the best. So right there, right there, I hit the lottery. Um, uh, I mean, I got to, you know, we produced nine Stephen Sondheim shows and yeah. Steve is always there. Um, he just doesn't say, oh, you can do our, my show. He's there watching, taking notes. Um, I mean, Cheetah Rivera, who gets to work with Cheetah Rivera? Joe yeah. Gray, I mean, Derek Jacoby, Franklin Jella. I, I mean, <laughs> uh, I got, I, I Brian Friel before he was no longer with us. I mean, there, gosh, there's, um, there's so many, um, you know, I mean, Sam, Sam, and he's like, he's my guy. I, I, I adore him. I'm so lucky that I got to work with him and then revive Cabaret again. I mean, Alan Cumming, Jane Krakowski, like all the Broadway divas, you know, from Kelly to Sutton to Audra, um, you know, I don't know if I can, if I can really just say one person, because mm -hmm. um, the playwrights that we've worked with, um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, Alfred Molina, I think like, I get to work with him. I think he's one of the most gifted, talented, like him and Franklin Jell are like, wow. Um, you know, Felicia Rashad, we did a musical with her. I mean, there's so many, we just did Soldier's Pie. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, David Allen Greer and Blair Underwood and, uh, you know, just so, so many, so many, so many people. I know, I'm, I, I mean, I, you know, I don't know. I, I'm John Stamos. He's he's become a, a he he was he was all he's on like three of our shows. He was like uh, he's you know you guys know him as Uncle Jesse, but I don't know. <laughs> there's there's so Jessica Lang, um, 
we just did something with Marissa Tomei. Um, I don't know. I mean, Gabriel Byrne. I mean, there's so. You, you guys really cool. have a, a repertoire of some of like the most talented folks that Annette hit. Annette Benning. Hit. We just work with Annette Benning. Who works with yeah. Annette Benning? Yeah. <laughs> Jessica Lang in Long Day's Journey into the Night was one of Into Night is one of the most incredible performances on the stage. She really was like remarkable. And she's a remarkable human. Like that's one thing, like there, there are so many people that we've gotten to work with. I mean, can you imagine doing a four hour show? I, I mean- And having that monologue at the end of it. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, this, this, this will be a good one for you. So the first preview, Jessica is up there giving it her all. You could hear a pin couldn't drop in the audience, right? Okay. And all of a sudden on the 43rd Street side door, so the American Airlines' main door is on the 42nd, the 43rd Street, we hear bang, bang, bang. Somebody's trying to get in. Now, what would a normal person do? Okay. Would you not call your security guard, run out? I was at the back of the theater. Todd and I were standing in the back of the theater. I thought, you know, you'd run out and you'd have the security person go get them. No, I opened the door and I said, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and meanwhile, we're in the day and age of active shooters and anybody could have come in and attacked the whole audience. And I, it was, are you ready for this? The guy delivering the cheese for the post-show reception. <laughs> wow. And he like ruined the first preview, but he stopped knocking. And I mean, I did it in a very quiet way. I opened the door an inch and I was like, you need to stop. And he was like, <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have the cheese. <laughs> and oh, I was right. front. <laughs> That's a great story. I have a lot of stories like that. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I mean, and if there's anything I can do for Catholic you in the drama department, I will do anything. You guys, I hope you know that. Um, I, I, my time there was really of fond memories and I believe in that school, you know, a lot. So call me, I'll be there if I can be. Thank you so much. Thank we you. really appreciate it. You know, congratulations. All right. Well, lots of love. And here's to 2021. Um, I hope you two will come see one of our shows. Um, Let's and, hope. <laughs> Jesus, God. If, right? Get over to the shrine if you ever get back and say a long prayer. Yeah. Pray. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Great. I'll talk to you guys soon. Okay. Take care. We hope you enjoyed that last episode. We're so excited to announce the launch of our campaign for two very important organizations, Broadway Cares and the Actors Fund to directly benefit the theater industry in the new year. With the inspiration and initiation from Broadway's Cesar Samayoa and Delon Grant of Come From Away, we will now be accepting donations to our company Venmo, which is at Whatcha Doin Podcast for the near future to split the donations between those two worthy organizations. And from there, we will be doing a big monthly donation to each organization on behalf of our podcast and its guests. We hope you can see it in your heart at this time to spare whatever you can. A dollar goes a long way right now and it's all to help an industry that has given us all so much. Thank you so much for all of your help to our listeners and followers, and please spread the word. We really appreciate it.